"'There is a wild beast in your woods,' said the artist Cunningham, as he was being driven to the station. It was the only remark he had made during the drive, but as Van Cheel had talked incessantly, his companion's silence had not been noticeable. "'A stray fox or two and some resident weasels, nothing more formidable,' said Van Cheel. The artist said nothing. "'What did you mean about a wild beast?' said Van Cheel later, when they were on the platform. "'Nothing. My imagination. Here is the train,' said Cunningham. That afternoon Van Cheel went for one of his frequent rambles through his woodland property. He had a stuffed bittern in his study, and knew the names of quite a number of wild flowers, so his aunt had possibly some justification in describing him as a great naturalist. At any rate, he was a great walker. It was his custom to take mental notes of everything he saw during his walks, and not so much for the purpose of assisting contemporary science as to provide topics for conversation afterwards. When the bluebells began to show themselves in flower, he made a point of informing everyone of the fact. The season of the year might have warned his hearers of the likelihood of such an occurrence, but at least they felt that he was being absolutely frank with them. What Van Cheel saw on this particular afternoon was, however, something far removed from his ordinary range of experience. On a shelf of smooth stone overhanging a deep pool in the hollow of an oak coppice, a boy of about sixteen lay a sprawl, drying his wet brown limbs luxuriously in the sun. His wet hair, parted by a recent dive, lay close to his head, and his light brown eyes, so light that there was an almost tigerish gleam in them, were turned towards Van Cheel with a certain lazy watchfulness. It was an unexpected apparition, and Van Cheel found himself engaged in the novel process of thinking before he spoke. Where on earth could this wild-looking boy hail from? The miller's wife had lost a child some two months ago, as supposed to have been swept away by the mill race, but that had been a mere baby, not a half-grown lad. "'What are you doing there?' he demanded. "'Obviously, sunning myself,' replied the boy. "'Where do you live?' "'Here, in these woods.' "'You can't live in the woods,' said Van Cheel. "'They are very nice woods.' said the boy, with a touch of patronage in his voice. "'But where do you sleep at night?' "'I don't sleep at night. That's my busiest time.' Van Cheel began to have an irritated feeling that he was grappling with a problem that was eluding him. "'What do you feed on?' he asked. "'Flesh,' said the boy, and he pronounced the word with slow relish as though he were tasting it. "'Flesh? What flesh?' Since it interests you, rabbits, wildfowl, hares, poultry, lambs in their season, children when I can get any, they're usually too well locked in at night when I do most of my hunting. It's quite two months since I tasted child flesh. Ignoring the chaffing nature of the last remark, Van Cheel tried to draw the boy on the subject of possible poaching operations. You're talking rather through your hat when you speak of feeding on hares. Considering the nature of the boy's toilet, the simile was hardly an apt one. Our hillside hares aren't easily caught. At night I hunt on four feet, was the somewhat cryptic response. I suppose you mean that you hunt with a dog, hazarded Van Cheel. The boy rolled slowly over onto his back and laughed a weird low laugh that was pleasantly like a chuckle and disagreeably like a snarl. I don't fancy any dog will be very anxious for my company, especially at night. Van Cheel began to feel that there was something positively uncanny about the strange-eyed, strange-tongued youngster. I can't have you staying in these woods, he declared authoritatively. I fancy you'd rather have me here than in your house, said the boy. The prospect of this wild, nude animal in Van Cheel's primly ordered house was certainly an alarming one. "'If you don't go, I shall have to make you,' said Van Cheel. The boy turned like a flash, plunged into the pool, and in a moment had flung his wet and glistening body halfway up the bank, where Van Cheel was standing. In an otter the movement would not have been remarkable. In a boy Van Cheel found it sufficiently startling. His foot slipped as he made an involuntary backward movement, and he found himself almost prostrate on the slippery weed-grown bank, with those tigerish yellow eyes not very far from his own.' 